Welcome to the Painting of the Week podcast, where we look at some of the most significant paintings throughout history. Introducing your hosts, Phil Grabsky and Laura Bentham. And welcome to this week's Painting of the Week, which is a woman with bent, seated woman with bent knees by Egon Schiele, uh, dated 1917. Uh, apologies for those of you who are loyal fans and have been waiting for our uh, uh, podcast. It's been unbelievably busy um, with a film release of our Vermeer The Greatest Exhibition, which basically just went nuts. What can I say? Went stratospheric. Which is lovely. Which is great. You've been more busy than I have, Phil, with that. I <laughs> have. I've been more busy in my greenhouse, sorting out tomatoes. You've been growing tomatoes? And yes. I've been growing an audience. <laughs> and something like and that. getting fantastic reviews, which is brilliant. Got amazing reviews, and I think what's really fun, and it's still, it's still in, still about 400 screenings to go, but we looked at a chart the other day of... Uh, 1,572 feature documentaries that have been released in the United Kingdom for which there was data to say over the last 25 years. 1,572 feature documentaries. And we are currently, I think, number 27 in that chart. That is brilliant. With a film about a painter. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're up against... Oh, yeah. Films like Senna and Amy and Touching the Void and I mean, Inconvenient Truth. and Okay. You know, these are big films with big marketing budgets and sometimes big names. And and then there's Little Old Us. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. By far the most successful documentary about an artist ever released. And um, I'm sure our podcast audience have been advocating... The film ardently. Does that completely off painting here now? We've gone straight off. I have. Does that mean that he is by far one of the greatest? So I know he's obviously going to say he was the greatest, but who can say who's the greatest painter? But does that then well make him the greatest painter? If that if people are that interested in him, to so there's a see? question, isn't there? Why why is this film done? Ten times better than our other films. Yeah, that's um, amazing. And, <laughs> you know, we've been analysing that. And, and, of course, a large part of it is the exhibition in Amsterdam at the Rijksmuseum, where they had 28 of his 37 surviving paintings. Right. Um, and the kind of press that was generated by that, that this was the only time that this was ever going to happen in human history. It's never happened before. It will never happen again for various reasons. OK. Um, and then, you know, the tickets were released in February right through to the end of June, oh, sorry, the 3rd of June, the end of the exhibition. They sold out. The website crashed. They sold out in two days. That gets another level yeah. of press. Um, but still, clearly, there is this desire to go and see Vermeers in the flesh. Even though you can see them individually in different galleries, if you go to America, you know, go to Washington and New York, in a day or in two days, you can see, um, is it nine Vermeers? Anyway, there's something about them all being in the one spot, that it's just this snowball effect. And then, you know, we were told that there were the black market tickets for the exhibition were 5,000 euros. Um, normally, when we work with galleries, part of the deal is they give us 10 tickets for free that we can give away for competitions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the Rijks Museum said, absolutely not. We don't have any we can give away for free. Um, and so there is an element of perfect storm about it, really. Yeah. Now, I have to say... In the 25 years we've been making art films and a lot of exhibitions that we've filmed for television and more, you know, obviously exhibition on screen since 2011 with Leonardo from the National Gallery, which was the first. We're now on our 34th. But um, 
The one question I've been asked more often than any other is, did we film the Vermeer exhibition in Washington in 1995? Oh, okay. Answer being no. Right. So when I heard there was going to be an exhibition in the Rijksmuseum, I was, you know, straight in contact with them and said, we have you. We have to be the ones making, you know, right. filming it. Yeah. We had worked with them before. They did know us. We'd done a Rembrandt film with them very successfully. Um, but still, you know, they're extraordinarily busy. They're trying to organise all these loans. No, 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 no. So you just have to be tenacious and just keep at them. Oh, that's great. I love um, it, Phil. But they did know us, and I went to talk to them and um, explain what we were doing and our approach, and they said, OK. Um, and essentially, we got kind of this exclusive access to film the exhibition in the way that we did. There was another film which I'm sure is very good. Um, I've, only, I've only seen the trailer, but that was much more about the preparations and the oh, okay. conservation yeah. mm-hmm. behind the scenes. So in a way, you've got this kind of um, pair of films, which, you know, if you're really interested, may work pretty well together. Yeah. But this is, you know, on the press day, the head of communications said to me, we've had 800 applications to film today. <laughs> like news, news from around the world, bloggers, and she said, it's ridiculous, we've turned basically most of them down because we just can't facilitate that. I think it's amazing. It's amazing. It's just amazing. amazing. Is that now also then social media is working in your favour now? Social media. And and that's just so easy then for things to take off. The fear of missing out. People don't want to miss out. It was that thing of... I mean, I'm not thinking... Maybe more now. Anyway, four to eight weeks ago, I was in Poland. I did nine screenings. And at each one, they'd ask me, what have you got coming up next? And I'd say, well, one of the films, you know, we've got Tokyo Stories and we've got Klimt, but we've got this film about Vermeer Mm. based on this exhibition. And I said every time, I said, but you won't get to see it. Yeah. The only way you'll ever see this exhibition is by watching this film. Uh, Every single time somebody stood up and said, very happily and proudly, we've been (laughs) or we're going. Yeah. Every time, and you thought, this is international. The yeah. film is, is selling out in Australia. Uh, so we like, and America, and France, and Germany. So this, it just goes to show, and I've fought commissioning, I've fought television commissioning editors for years who say, oh, there's no interest, who, who cares about art? No one's interested in it. Yeah. It goes to show people are interested. If there's, mm. if there's an offering that just ticks the boxes, and then people start talking about it, and then, now... There's then the second stage, which is, so the, so two things happened for us. One, the first night we were in about 170, 180 cinemas. We had a lot of sellouts. So the cinemas all thought, oh, okay, we'll keep this going. Then we've got other cinemas coming in. One chain came to us and said, we want it in 110 cinemas, you know, because oh, they're, okay. they're reacting to success. Yeah. For our part, what we did well was the the film's really good. The poster is nice. And even the title, though. Mm. I, I've said before, that if, if I'd have called it Vermeer Master of Light or, you know, Magician of Colour or... Yeah. I, I, I said right from the start, we, we, we were really straightforward here. Vermeer, the greatest exhibition. Yeah. So you kind of know exactly mm. what you're getting. Then you've got a couple of great press quotes... The Guardian saying this is more than an exhibition, this is a miracle, or whatever it was. Or, <laughs> um, and then we got some five star. I mean, we had the most amazing reviews. I mean, it, it, I'd have been embarrassed to write them myself. Um, just people saying, and I'm absolutely getting it. Yeah, it's fantastic. Why, why this is not, you know, if you can't go to the exhibition, this is perfect. If mm. you've been to the exhibition, this is perfect. And then it all snowballs. So then you get a two-page spread in the Times and then you're on the Today Show and then you're on BBC World Service and then you're in the art newspaper. And Every time I look around for you, Phil, you were somewhere else but not able to do a podcast. And that's time. why there's been no <laughs> po- Exactly. Well, I did say you could do one on your own. I know. Um, I'll be but, too afraid of the, <laughs> the listeners. But, you know, our, 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 we, we, you know, we are constantly in production. I'm having six conversations a day about six different projects. Yeah, and great. so already, you know, yesterday we launched Tokyo Stories, which, you know, clearly won't do as well as Vermeer, but it's a really nice film, very energetic. 
And it just gives us a chance to explore Japanese art over a period of 400 years in my favourite city in the world, which is Tokyo. I absolutely love it. It's so exciting. Yeah, actually, it's my husband's. Is it? Yeah, he loves it. I've never been. He went for business. He loves it. Oh, you've you got to go. It's, it's because... I can't really go. I can't believe we're around 10 minutes in and I'm already somewhere I've got to go to. Well, the thing We about, haven't gone to food yet. <laughs> we haven't gone to Sheila <laughs> either. But, oh, the, no. but the thing about um, <laughs> Tokyo is that it's like art is... is in fact, my, the director, David, was saying they didn't have a word for art because it was just so much part of their world, of their life. Mm. There was no separate word for it. And actually, if you go to Tokyo, you get it. It's not like art separate. Every little back street, you know, I do a lot of running, as you know, and you go down these little back streets and the gardens are perfect. And, yeah. and I don't know, you just see little things in windows, beautiful origami. or I don't know, they're just, everything's very artistic um and then there's just different styles of art on the on the underground and on buses and on shop fronts and i mean it's just the best place anyway we also have a film yeah shooting right now in vienna as we speak about klimt mm. and then just that's going back to art though the art and your films and how popular it all is is going back to our conversation a while ago, we were saying, I I'll always think of the things that were on the wall when I was a child mm. or on my walls now and what people put on their walls. And it's, all, it's all just sort of defined by how the life, you know, our lives, how, what have we done, how we started. My mum and dad had tonnes of Toulouse a trek. No idea why. My mum obviously loved him. So did your mum and dad go to museums and galleries then? A l yeah, quite a bit. Hmm. Quite a bit. I mean, they weren't... They, they, used, they used to be a thing. We used to be able to go for a day trip to New, um, from New Haven on the ferry. Do you, I don't know if you remember that. Years ago, you used to get the really, really, really early ferry and you could get to Paris. And that was... Hmm. My mum, she did that a lot. I used to go that way um, by train yeah. from London. Okay, it was really early, the ferry. Hmm get on the train and straight down to Paris. So that would have been my mum's thing. Extraordinarily mm. tatty, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I just remember it being really tatty. The mm. train transferred onto the boat. The boat mm. was tatty. The French train was tatty. But then you're in Paris. Yeah, exactly. Which is lovely. But it's so. interesting, though, because my parents had lots of stuff. <laughs> so... There'd be a jar of coins. There'd be a bowl of cigarette um, matches that my dad had taken from hotels. There would be oh. <laughs> royal anniversary or commemorative plates and cups on the wall. There was this... But paintings, mm. I don't really... I know in the inside front door there was one of Queen Charlotte and whoever she was married to. But... Um, yeah, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, there was probably some prints of impressionist works dotted about but it wasn't really part of our world but you, you were saying just before we started yeah in your hallway yeah and i didn't know this no well tell the story i have this picture my friend gave it to me no hold on no 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 but when you were when you were a kid oh yeah no not this no, no. now I know, but when you were a kid, didn't you have Klimt face no that was this is now oh, so this is yeah. now okay so tell us about my now. friend gave me this as a card oh. and um I've known her since I was seven. And uh, she gave me this picture as a, a birthday card or something. I loved it so much, I put it in one of those little glass clip frames that we all did when mm. we were younger. And then hung it on, in my hallway. And then, over the years, I had got the mother and daughter as a card for Klimt mm. because I love the little picture of the girl because she looks so much like my daughter. And it's they're opposite each other. Wow. And then as we've been doing... Uh, Sheila today, or yeah, we're going to do it today. Hopefully, we'll get onto it in a minute. <laughs> I realised then how linked they are, which is okay. actually because me and you were always talking about coincidences, of course, which yeah, is okay. funny. Well, what do you know having had having had the postcard on your wall? What do we know about this painting? I I didn't know anything Drawing. about it, but yes, I was going to ask you that. Well, I've I would. You. I, I Luckily, just, I've asked you. Yeah, first. okay. I always. I would have called that a drawing, and That's most a drawing. of his his things to me were drawings. Mm. 
and actually I really love his drawings and his work because I do love the way he makes them they are just sort of full of passion and the expressions on their faces they do look this one not so much I think she looks lovely and relaxed and like she's just sat down and is just you know taking it easy I think there's a I think there's some kind of different styles of painting there um brush strokes obviously the hair is is rendered differently to the stockings in or indeed the green top so he's obviously started with the drawing and then he's painted in he's painted areas of it um but what, but what do what do we know so this is his wife we believe yes. this is his wife yes yes so Sheila is born in 1890 mm-hmm. and dies, unfortunately, in 1918. Mm. So when you hear that awful figure of over a million people dying at the end of the First World War yeah. of influenza, Spanish flu, call it what you will, it's a huge figure and it's one of those figures that's so huge you don't necessarily personalise it with individuals. Well, this woman dies and Sheila dies mm. three days later. Mm. Of of Spanish flu. So a year a year after this picture. Um, yeah, because Klimt died in the same year, didn't he? That uh, Egon Sheila died. Not not of Spanish flu. No, no. but of pneumonia. Yeah. Well, I suppose they could be connected. Yeah, but, but they, no, it didn't. It wasn't exactly Spanish flu, but yeah. So um, painted in Vienna. Mm. Um which was an extraordinary city, you know. Extraordinary city, you know, I've, I've, I've made films about Vienna in the late 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, 1800, 1810, with, you know, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven. And then again, kind of 1900, this fervent of creativity, um, particularly in, in writing... And we have it expressionism. This is an expressionist painting as opposed to an impressionist. And I think I suspect the term expressionist was deliberately as a counter to impressionist. Yeah. Because um, mm. towards the end of the nineteenth century, there was that you know the impressionists were already had an air of being slightly conservative. Right. When they started, they were very radical. We now probably think of them as being quite radical, but there came a point when they were the older generation. Picasso famously, when he was living in Montmartre, uh, who was it walked past? I think Manet walked up the hill and Picasso just ignored him because to him he was the older generation. Right. (laughs) Anyway, so these expressionists, and it's a difficult term because it can include an awful lot of things, but I guess in its broadest sense, it's not about depicting reality or surface sensation. It's about depicting something more something deeper in the psychology, a response to sensations, a response to the inner. So you have Freud and psychoanalysis is all part of this this time. Yeah. When you were in Vienna, were you aware of Sheila's, Sheila's oh, work? Oh, yeah, no. Sheila and, Sheila and Klimt are... Are they everywhere? They are the preeminent pairing of, of Viennese artists. Yeah. OK. And the, and, the, and the museums and galleries in Vienna are... St- Fantastic. And full of a lot of his work. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because I had no idea that they were the same sort of period. And obviously, um, Sheila really looked looked up to Klimt, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, and Klimt was and pretty, pretty open to him, too. Yeah. Because this, 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 this drawing or painting, however, it just looks so natural. It looks like he's just done mm. it in almost half an hour. Think about it's this. It's unbelievable. See, this is the, one of the reasons I really like this picture is that it's a great example of where a picture, mm. I think, is better than a photograph. Mm. I think you'd be hard-pressed to take a picture of this woman that says as much about her character, her feelings at the time. I mean, she's, it's quite a seductive look. Yeah. Very hard to capture that in photography at the time, I would say. Um, but everything about it, just the the... the Slightly scruffy nature of her hair and the way she's looking and the red lips contrasting with the green top and the black stockings and 
it's all very relaxed and open at the same time and yeah and so that's on the one hand and on the other hand um there's a really nice bit in the Mary, our recent Mary Cassatt film where the curator talks about one of her paintings and the difficulty is this kind of perspective when hands and arms and knees and legs are all coming out of the frame. Yeah. It's tremendously difficult to do. But he's known, isn't he, um, Sheila, for his hands, especially the distortion on them. Yeah. Many people Which... are terrible at hands. Um, yeah. Vermeer, one, as you were saying earlier, one of the greatest artists of all time, <laughs> Have a look at his hands. I mean, they're not Not brilliant. so good. No, they're not. <laughs> um, but actually, if you look at this woman, mm. there's so many different, you know, the left leg as we're looking at it yeah. is, is in a certain perspective. The right knee pulled up. Really tough to do that. And he doesn't even bother finishing the feet. They're not important to him. No. And then her back, the way back, the back's yeah. turn, the way the head. And it looks, it might be expressionist it might not be a photograph but it's also totally realistic but also the stories of of the sitters come through with with his work because i've looked at some of his other paintings and some a lot of self-portraits of his mm. i think he was quite a character and uh, the the distortion in the body the sort of gnarliness of the painting and mm. then the hands the characters of these people just come through Inside, just mm. it's such a great way. The stories that they, that they tell are just so lovely and free. I just love the drawing of this. It's so just free. Well, you, I mean, you, you get a sense of a very close relationship between him and her. Mm. I mean, he's got his. He's got his. You know, we don't have much. Well, I mean, the, the, you know, his biography is mm. uh, fruity. <laughs> Shall we say? And, um, and clearly, well, I always wait for you to say the things, Phil. <laughs> I'll leave it to you. I don't want to offend anybody. But no, also, we don't want to offend anybody. But also, you know, um, some of his other paintings are particularly fruity. Um, there was a there was an uh, there was a willingness to express sexuality, which even today can be you know quite shocking to some. Um, but then Klimt, ha- I mean, Klimt had loads of mistresses and oh, yeah. they often slept with the people they were painting. Yeah. And then... They had loads of kids too. Right. Um, so, but I, when you look at Klimt's paintings of those, you know, the formal paintings that he did of uh, the ones that he was selling. Klimt talking about, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't think those ladies who wanted to be painted would have been quite so pleased with... Sheila's particular, you know, depiction of them. If he'd done them, their uh, their hands a bit. I think also one has to bear in mind that this. You know, I mean, I don't know the full biography of Klimt, but no. Um, often these are really quite poor women, mm. and the artist is frankly taking advantage of them. I mean, for them to earn a few sous or you know just a little bit of money from being painted was a bit, quite a big deal. Right. Yeah. And then, so if the painter then asks for more, it probably would have been quite hard for these women to say no. Um, you know, I you, you do wonder how often, and maybe even even still, you know, you, you hear similar stories right now from the fashion industry, and you know, it's not it's not no, something that yeah. doesn't doesn't continue to happen really, where young impre- young people are taken advantage of. Mm. Wrongly, mm. this of course is different. This is his wife, yeah, and this this to me speaks of a really quite close and intimate relationship that they had. Yeah, I should, yeah. I think they. Well, I felt really sad today when I looked <laughs> at the how he died, and mm. because she was six months pregnant. Oh, was she? And she died. Yeah, when she died, oh. and then he died three days later. Um, and then one of his final paintings is called The Family. Oh. And I looked at it, and it is really, really... A, it's a lovely painting. And then you just thought, oh, it's, it's quite... Yeah, it's really, mm. really hard, tough. So, I mean, I guess one of the lessons of this is it's, you know, it's quite easy to see a Sheila or a Klimt mm. and just see one and think, oh, I don't like that style. Yeah. And then ignore them. Mm. 
what you actually have to do with someone like Sheila is right. You might there might be a painting you come across you're not really very fond of, but you know these painters are these painters are varied, and it's worth looking at, and it's not that hard to do with 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 the internet. It's worth looking at a broader range of what they've done, and yeah, you don't have to like everything a painter does to just, to yeah. appreciate certain works. I mean, I don't. I'd have this on my wall. My wall's running out of space because <laughs> most podcasts I'd have it on. I definitely, well, I, I definitely have yeah, You already do. <laughs> I already have it on my wall. But it's the power of the drawing to me that he's done. And, 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 and the ones that he's, that some of the others, that, um, especially his self-portraits, mm. I really, really like. Um, they just look. Because he had quite and, a tough... Um, background didn't he yeah he's lived on a rail his um his father was a railway man so i think they lived either near or on a actually on a one of those you know station in a railway station probably a small railway station mm. and he used to sketch all the time to the extent that his dad destroyed his sketchbooks which is a horrible mm. thing to do i mean that would have Ah, oh, that would have really affected a young, young person. Yeah, I wonder if he's got those painted those drawings of his early uh, sketchbook of the trains. <laughs> well, I'm saying his dad destroyed them. Did he destroy them all? Well, ah. whether whether the, I mean I don't know if any survived. Right. Because um, that would have been so unusual to have a, you know, a train drawing and then. <laughs> then his dad dies of syphilis. Syphilis, yeah. And you know that's that's not a pleasant way to die, and probably brought a degree of shame mm. um, on the family. And they say it haunted him. I did it. Mm. Okay. Then he goes off to his uncle, I think. Yeah. Who was another railway man, but um, kind of begrudgingly let him study art, which is, which is a common refrain, you know, artists who are begrudgingly allowed by their parents to study it because it, no one thinks it's a proper job. No. Um, it's funny, isn't it, that? And then he obviously... Yeah. Some of this is natural skill and some of it is acquired skill th- through sheer hard work. Well, he's definitely skilled, I think. It's wonderful. And this is, you know, a 27-year-old. Mm. 26, 27-year-old. Yeah. Um, it just looks like it's done almost with just one line. It just, it is just, they are, I love them so much. So, I just, I, and I like the fact that there's nothing on the background. Mm. It's quite unusual. Actually, that would really, that would really, that wouldn't help at all to have any background. No. At all. No. It would just be a distraction and the fact she would, it would make her sit very flat. But no, I think nearly loads of his paintings haven't got backgrounds. Mm. (laughs) Especially if you're comparing him to Klimt. (laughs) It's like hours on the background. Yeah. I get loads of quilt inspiration from... um, Klimt. Klimt, yeah, I love love those. His paintings are unbelievable. Oh, that's gonna be that's gonna be Klimt's fantastic. The kiss. It's gonna be a, give me a cracker. <laughs> um, as always, uh, we urge you to visit seventh hyphen art dot com for uh, background stuff, but the ability to download, stream previous films, um, and. Um, We'll be back soon with another podcast. Um, if we leave a gap, then you get more successful. So, <laughs> I think, I think, I think this is it now. I think the BAFTA one year and this the next. Exactly, is... last time the BAFTA, no, now it's... five stars everywhere. I think now it's about <laughs> managing decline. No, I didn't mean that. You can't say that. Um, There's got... always the greenhouse and a cup of tea, Phil. We've got plenty more paintings to talk about in painting of the week. <laughs> Um, We'll see you soon. (laughs) Thank you for listening to the Painting of the Week podcast. For more information, please visit our website at seventh-art.com or contact us by emailing info at seventh-art.com. See you next time.